Am I good enough? Does my voice matter? Who am I to be here? Do I look fat? Am I learning and growing? What is my truth in this moment? If not me, then who? How do I feel? What you've just witnessed are two conversations that happen in my brain every single day. Worry and wonder. Worry is the voice of fear, of doubt, of you're not ready yet or you're not going fast enough. Worry is the part of me that wants to play it safe, not speak my truth, and color inside the lines. For years, worry prevented me from getting on this stage and sharing this message with you. Worry said, your story doesn't matter, and you're not ready yet. That's what worry does. Worry creates a ripple of fear that, cre that keep our dreams at bay. <clears throat> Luckily, though, there's wonder. And wonder, she's got her back. Wonder is the investigative sidekick that questions my worry and dives deep into their origin to create new and more empowering stories. Wonder is my creative muse and my curiosity sidekick that always encourages me to give it a try because let's see what happens. When I choose wonder, doors open, dots connect, and I get the feeling that I'm on serendipity highway. Now, if you were given the option to hang out with worry or to hang out with wonder, who would you choose? Who would you choose? Wonder. The answer seems obvious, right? Why would we not hang out with wonder? According to Dr. James Doty, who's a neurosurgeon at Stanford, 80% of our time and attention is spent with regret about the past or anxiety about the future. 80% of our time is spent worrying. Now, if you're like me, you might find it concerning that for the majority of our time on this precious earth, it spends on some story in our head telling us something that might not even be true. Let's look at a few examples. Maybe wonder says, I want more me time. I know I need space for myself. I want to go within. I'm always so busy. I'm always taking care of everyone else. I want time for me. But worry might say, that's selfish. Who are you to have time for yourself? And what happens? Well, our energy levels stay pretty low, and we can't show up as our best self. Or maybe wonder says, I have to write my book. There's a book swirling around inside of me, and I must bring it to the world. But worry might say, who are you to write a book? You're not ready. You can't do that. And what happens? Well, our bookshelf, it stays empty. Or maybe wonder says, I want to take my family on a trip abroad. I want to go to Morocco. I feel so drawn there. But worry might say, that's irresponsible. That's too much money. You don't have time for that. And what happens? Well, our passport, it stays blank. Are you feeling me? WTF? What is going on here? What is happening? Why is it that we stop and don't create the things that we most long to create? Why is it that worry and fear and doubt gets in the way of us creating our most interesting life? When I look back on my own journey, I see myself as a kid filled with infinite curiosity and wonder for the world around me. But then slowly, over time, that wonder was socialized and conditioned out of me and replaced with worry. It wasn't until my early 20s when I was struggling with an eating disorder, I was just out of a breakup and completely heartbroken, and even though I was successful by um, all means on paper, I'd worked with Apple and Dove and all these big brands, I didn't feel successful on the inside. And so I started to get really curious. I started wondering, what's going on here? And I realized that the top regret, I did some research, realized that the top regret of the dying is I wish I had lived a life true to myself and not the life that others had expected of me. And 80% of the world's workers were reportedly disengaged with their work. What's going on? This curiosity led me to study the intersection of psychology, creativity, and well-being. 
It led me to use myself as a guinea pig on a number of creative experiments and ideas, and it led me to work with thousands of creatives and entrepreneurs and those who aspired to be in digging into this work. And what I discovered were a core set of worries and fears and doubts that emerge in the process of creating anything. And I want to talk about three of the big ones today. First, am I good enough to do this? I don't know if any of you have ever wondered, is there something that you want to create, but you've wondered, am I good enough to do this? Can anyone relate? Yeah, I know. Woo! <laughs> I'm going to tell a story of how this question played out again and again and again in my life. So a few years ago, after I had spent a period of time helping creatives and entrepreneurs shepherd their ideas into the world, I started noticing that there was something in me that, that I also wanted to bring to the world. But this question of worry was saying, but that makes money. That does, you're good at that. Keep doing that. And one day I was like, but I'm curious. Let's see what's possible. But I kept coming back to this question, am I good enough to do this? And what I found in all the people that I've worked with, the root of inaction typically comes to this question. This is what's beneath the surface. So this all began to shift, though, one day. I was walking down Mott Street in Nolita, and I literally felt my body wanting me to turn the other direction. But of course, I was busy, busy, busy. I had somewhere to be. I didn't have time to go listen to my body. But I kept walking, and I kept walking, and I kept feeling literally like this visceral pull. And worry says, this is weird, keep going. And of course, wonder said, this is interesting, I wonder what's there. And so I decided, okay, what, what the hell? So I turn around, I walk through uh, Mott Street, through Nolita, into the Little Italy, and I walk into an art gallery. And as I walk into this art gallery, there's mixed media art lining the walls, and this sense of awe came over me. And I heard a voice inside of me whisper, it's time to make some art. But of course, worry said, art? You don't have an art degree. You don't have any experience in this. Who are you to make art? And wonder said, this sounds really fun. That guy right there, I think he's in charge. Maybe you should ask him. So I turned to the guy in the gallery and I said, hey, if I can bring 12 women here next week, will you teach us about art? Will you teach us how to make art? And a week later, Twelve of us got together with a lot of wine, some good music, and we made smart. <laughs> we embraced imperfection, we got messy, and we had a lot of fun. And once this ball started to get moving, once I had given myself permission to do something that I didn't think that I could do, I started wondering, hmm, what else can I do? A man who made art at the gallery said to me, it's all about the concept, Amber. If you can nail the concept, the execution is figure outable. What it finds your concept. So I'm again, I'm walking down the streets of New York. I'm wondering, what is my concept? What is my concept? And in that question, I realized my concept is my biggest curiosity. What is my biggest curiosity right now? And what I was curious about was the stories going on inside of people's heads. When I walk down the street, I'm like, what is that New Yorker thinking about? What are they afraid of? What do they dream of doing? And so I decided, why don't I start talking to strangers? Of course. So the next day, <laughs> I go into my local cafe in Dumbo, Brooklyn Roasting Co., and I have a set of note, or post-it notes, I have markers, and I'm ready to talk to some strangers. And of course, I sit there, I have my coffee, and worry all of a sudden is saying, this is silly, everyone here is really busy, don't interrupt or bother them. And wonder says to me, well, hey, that guy sitting next to you, he's already noticed that you're staring at him, and you're kind of freaking him out, so you might as well just engage in a conversation. So I turn to him and say, hey, I'm working on an art project. Can I ask you a few questions about the meaning of life? He's like, the meaning of life? Sure. So I hand him these questions, and he's answering. And you know, he has this feeling of, wow, this feels really good. Thank you. I needed that break. And then, of course, the man across the table says, what's this? I want to I try. And the woman next to me says, can I participate? And next thing I know, I've talked to 15 people in this cafe. And over the next few weeks, I've talked with hundreds and hundreds of strangers in New York, on subways, at events, at restaurants, whoever was open and willing to tell me what love meant to them, what freedom meant to them, what they were grateful for, what they were afraid of, and the world that they wanted to live in. So now I have all of this data. I've had all of these conversations. I had an older gentleman tell, break down crying to me because he was afraid that he wasn't there for his children the way that he wanted to be there. It's real. I had a woman 
say to me, you know, I can't believe I'm going to tell you this, but, and she got really vulnerable and shared something that she couldn't believe she was sharing with a stranger. And I realized that there was something about these questions and having a, a, a safe space for people to be able to interact with them. And so I'm walking through Dumbo, and I'm wondering, okay, I have all this data. I know there's something to this. I've got the concept, I think. Now what do I do with this? And that's when I realized that the Dumbo Art Festival was happening in my neighborhood in three weeks. And my whole body, like energy from my feet to my, to my head, exploded inside of me, and I knew I must be in this art festival. So I go home, I go online to the website, and I see that, unfortunately, applications had closed three months ago. Worry says, see, you're not ready to be an artist. And Wonder says, find out who's in charge and email her right now. So I find out who's in charge. I put together this email, and I'm about to hit send. And Worry says, stop, that's rude. Application's already closed. And Wonder says, send the effing email. So I send the email. And then I obsessively, every 10 minutes, check my email to see if she's responded for three days. And a few days later, she replies back, and she says, Amber, it really looks like you know what you're doing. I had no idea what I was doing. I found you a wall. Be ready in three weeks. And three weeks later, at the Dumbo Art Festival, the world we want launched. And this was a project that asked you two questions. I want to live in a world where, and to create this world, I will. So both the possibility piece of what you envision and the responsibility piece of here's what I'm going to do about it. And 200,000 people came through, and just incredible stories were coming out of it. And then something interesting happened. Suddenly, I started getting emails from people all over the world who said, hey, I want to bring this to my community. I want to bring this to my community. And I thought, great, OK. So I created a way, a playbook, for whoever wanted to create a wall to create a wall. And the idea spread to 20 countries and hundreds of walls went up around the world. One of my favorite examples is this one in the top right corner, which is in Tel Aviv, Israel. And what you see are two um, men, one's Arab and one's Israeli, writing about the world that they want to live in, and they want to live in the same world. And in a space of division and conflict, I think there was a, like, a bomb that happened um, a few blocks from this on the week of this, so it was just a really special time. But here are two people you know, in a, in a state of conflict, and they're able to express and have a safe space to talk about that world that they want to live in. So I share all of this to say that there were so many times in this process where I wondered, am I good enough to do this? I had no experience in art. I had never done anything like this before. But I was able to make it happen. I was able to get out of my own way so the work could come through me. And so if there's something that you want to create, whether it's time for yourself, whether it's a trip, whether it's a book, whether it's an album or an art project, whatever it is for you, I invite you to not ask, am I good enough to do this, but rather to ask, will I regret not doing this a year from now? Regret, I love this concept in terms of decision making. It's something that I learned from Jeff Bezos at Amazon. And his whole idea is that when he looks a year from now or looks on his deathbed, will he look back and regret not doing this and using that as a tool for decision making? Because when we're in the moment, when we're in our head, we can't think about the future. We're so worried about, am I good enough to do this now? But when we can step to the side and look and be like, is this important enough to pursue it and to really go after it? So will you regret not doing this a year from now? It's around this time when I'm talking to people that usually this is the next worry that comes up for them. They're like, yeah, there is something I want to create, but where do I find the time? I feel you. We've got busy lives, especially here in New York and New Jersey. <laughs> so about a month ago, I went to a workshop with Elizabeth Gilbert. And the reason I went to this workshop is because I know I have this book swirling around inside, this wonder and worry book. And of course, I have this and this and this project and my... my calendar is so full that I have not had time to spend on the book. And so I go to this workshop hoping for some clarity. And I'm in the audience, and someone asks her, I'm so busy. There is this thing that I want to do, but I don't have time. And what she said next stopped me dead in my tracks. She said, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, what are you willing to give up for the life that you claim that you want? What are you willing to give up? for the life that you claim that you want. 
For me, I was claiming that I wanted to be an author, but I had so much in the way of doing that. And so after I sat with this question and when I walked home from the workshop, I got home and I pulled out my journal. And I wrote two columns. I want this, and I want this even more. And I wanted to go to Bali in January, and I wanted to launch this notebook product, and I wanted to do this and this and this and drink wine with friends and all of these things and have social media on my phone. But I realized that even more I wanted to write this book. And so I canceled a trip to Bali, I said no to a few projects, and I created three weeks of space in my calendar to sit down and write my proposal. And on the 333rd day of the year, with 33 days left, I didn't know this until someone told me after, I finished my proposal. And you're not going to believe what happened that night. I still can't believe it. I go to an event, and who do I meet? I meet Elizabeth Gilbert. And I'm able to go up to her. Well, go up to her is, is an understatement. Here's what happened. I see her, and Worry's like, don't be a fangirl. Go easy. Don't freak out. And wonder, well, she was about to tell me something, but I was so excited that I just screamed, Liz Gilbert, I love you! And she's about 10 feet away from me, and my fiancé, who was with me, says, <laughs> yells to her, she's nervous. <laughs> and Liz smiles and says, come here, come here, come here. So I run up there and attack her with a hug. And I was able to tell her, I went to your workshop a month ago, and I've just finished my proposal. Thank you. And I felt like this was such a good sign, or as my friend said, that wasn't a sign, Amber, that was a billboard. Such a good sign of what's possible when we commit to that thing we know we must do. These sorts of clues, these sorts of hints show up on our path to tell us, yes, you're going the right direction. And Liz was that for me. So I'll ask you again, what are you willing to give up for the life that you claim that you want? I have to be honest, one of the things that I had to give up was not taking action because someone might criticize my work, not taking action because someone might not like what I have to say. It's really easy to stay inside of my loft writing to myself, but once we put it out there, we open ourselves to criticism and rejection, and that's a part of the process. A really real story that I hesitated to share with you, but because I hesitated, I figured you should probably share it. Um, so after I finished my proposal, I sent it out to a number of agents that I was in conversation with. And one wrote back and he said, you know, this is interesting. Your voice is warm, but I think it's not fully baked. Da -da 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 -da. And so I wrote him back and asked, you know, asked questions, follow-up questions to understand and see what I can improve. And this is what he wrote me back. Oh, I skipped this part. The third worry, what will they think of me? So this is, this is the email that he wrote me back. Amber, stop! You're not ready! More and more and more. I think you should spend an egoless year or three or more developing and proving something before you give any more thought to a book. Ouch. The interesting thing about rejection is that the way our brain experiences rejection like this is the way our body experiences physical pain. So it's no wonder that we don't want to feel rejected, because it literally lights up the part of our brain that experiences the physical pain. And so here I get this email. I'm full on in a physical pain moment. I want to crawl into a hole. I want to cry. I want to lick my wounds and eat ice cream. And then I remember the section of my book entitled, Aim for Rejection. Because rejection is evidence that we're outside our comfort zone. Rejection is a signal that we're putting ourselves out there and doing the work. And rejection is an inevitable part of creating anything. How many of you have ever felt rejected or gotten rejected in your path? Yeah. yeah. Rejection, the path of no, can actually lead you to the path of yes. And what's interesting is that, so I had this awful email, and then, well, I guess it was honest, thank you, for filtering out. Um, and then a few days later, I get on a call with another agent who I honestly thought was a little out of my league. And I get on the phone call with her, and she says, Amber Ray, I'm so excited to talk to you. And I was like, really? Thanks, yay. And she says to me, I was sitting on the subway, and I opened her proposal, and I literally yelled out, holy shit, this girl can write. She's like, I could feel it. I was there. I was with you. I felt like you were in my head. I related to it. 
And that's such an interesting example of how one person would be like, this isn't baked, you should stop, you're not ready, and one person would say, you're ready, let's do this. And that's how the path of no leads to the path of yes. One of my favorite examples of this is Paulo Coelho in his book, The Alchemist. His book was actually rejected over 200 times before he went to sell 75 million copies. Imagine if he had stopped at time two, at time five, at time 10, 50, 100, 150, 199. Imagine if he gave up at 199 and said, must not be good enough. No one likes it. I'm just going to quit now. Instead, he kept going, and he sold 75 million copies of his book. And that's why I believe that persistent trumps talent. Yes, talent is important, but the way we close the gap between where our talent is and where our talent could be is through persistence, through showing up and continuing to face the adversities that come our way. How do you guys feel about persistence? So, here's what I know to be true. I know that if you choose just 1% more worry than wonder, if you choose to look through a lens of wonder when you're falling down the trap of worry, if you choose to be curious about that path, anything that you want to create is possible. Anything that you want to create. And this is just not, this is not a feel-good mantra. This is actually proven by science. If we choose wonder over worry, if we choose to lean into that lens of curiosity, we can actually rewire our brain and change the reality that we live in. It's called neuroplasticity, and it refers to the science that our brains can change when we train them to do so. So let's choose wonder and make our wildest, most interesting dreams come true this year. That is my invitation. So to close, I invite you all to close your eyes and put your hand on your heart. I heard from Valerie that this is something that you did last year, and so I thought maybe we can create a tradition. <laughs> so put your, close your eyes and put your hand on your heart. And I want you to bring to your mind's eye that one thing that's most important to you to create in 2017. That one thing that if you do not do it, you will feel regret. That one thing that will bring you closer to living your most brave and interesting life yet. Can you see it? Now I want you to imagine yourself in the process of pursuing it. I want you to imagine yourself feeling the joy that comes along with the process of being in it. I want you to feel what it's like when you get there. How does that feel? You can open your eyes. To take this one step further, I've designed an interactive installation that will be at your headquarters at, in both New York and New Jersey that we get to create together. It's a collective art piece, and it's called the heart piece. And the idea is that it shows the heartbeat of the company. And so when you get back to your office, this will all be set up for you to write that number one thing for you on a post-it note and to put it onto the heart to help create this heartbeat. Thank you.